Hello. I'll stand back here. Welcome, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and get started here while, yes. Okay, all right, I will wait. Should I do the welcoming, uh, all that stuff? Can I go ahead and do that? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is the first session, so I thought I would go through all the, the whole thing. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes, please. Oh, hey, I am on. Yeah, hi, can, oops.
Okay. Um, actually, Patricia, if you can hear me, are you going to do your uh, talk live? Um, hi, Steve. Yes. Um, um, I am just to make sure I don't uh, overuse my time. I would prefer that the recording is played. Okay. Yes. So you'll use the recording. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I, but shall I uh, play it on my on my own computer, or will it be played there? I think you. I think the technical people will play it from here. So okay. I think you're good. Okay, great. Okay, Thank perfect. you. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay. Now I left. Uh, here's my paper. Okay. So welcome everyone. Uh, I I get to be the first person to uh, the guinea pig to figure out all the technical details. So thank you for bearing with me. So welcome everyone to the Tadwig 2022 virtual conference. Um, this is the contributed orals one session and I'm your moderator, Steve Baskoff. So we're very grateful for the tech support from Pinsoft Publishers and Vibe Systems teams. So this session will be recorded for later viewing one thing I would just remind speakers is to um, speak slowly and clearly, um, which I will remind myself for people who are not native English speakers. And I think we also are going to have uh, captions as well. So please uh, speak slowly and clearly. Thank you for joining us and welcome to all the speakers for this session. Each of the presenters will present for 10 minutes. Then we'll have three minutes for questions uh, at the end of each presentation and two minutes to transition between the presenters. If you are presenting online, um, please, or if you're attending online, please ask your questions in the chat feature in Zoom, and then uh, we'll make sure that we ask those to the presenters. If you are presenting in person, um, this microphone is not a portable microphone. So if you would please come up to the front and we, you can use one of these microphones, we'll need to uh, use them so the people who are remotely participating can hear your question. Um, okay, so the chat function has uh, been made available for technical questions. So please use this judiciously. Any inappropriate use of chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat function disabled. If you would like to continue the conversation online, the Tadwig 2022 Slack workspace has a channel for this session. It's called, uh, what is it, CO1 or I think. Yeah, CO1. Okay, so this link was provided. Um, to via email to MailChimp. So if you're not on the Slack, you can connect in that way. By participating in the conference, you agree to abide by the Tadwig Code of Conduct. So please uh, take a look at that. It's linked in the conference website. And, and thank you for bearing with us on technical difficulties and please enjoy the session. So welcome. And our first uh, presentation uh, is going to be Patricia Martin Cabrera. She's presenting on establishing plankton imagery uh, data flows towards international biodiversity data aggregators, and it will be a recording. Um, hello. If there is a problem with the recording, I can also do it live. 
I think they're working on uh, on trying to get it started. So okay. we'll see in a moment. Okay, so, but I should unmute me and the video, should I keep it off on? Yeah, I think, I think if you wait just a moment, they may be able to get the recording running. Okay, perfect. Otherwise, I'm, I'm ready to share my screen and do it live if necessary. Um, okay, Patricia, if you are willing to do the live presentation, maybe we should go ahead and do that because the recording's not working yet. Yeah, no problem. Uh, okay, so you, you can hear me well and... Yes, very well. Share my screen. Hmm. Actually... Let me see if it will work to actually play the recording myself. Hello, my name is Patricia Cabrera from the Plan Extending Institute in Belgium, and I will present you on behalf of my colleagues establishing plankton imagery data flows towards international biodiversity data aggregators. Uh, so, first, I would like to start this presentation with the protagonist of this. Okay, we are seeing the video fine, but the the um, volume is not uh, very high. Right. Uh, um, okay, so let me just then find quickly a presentation without the video. <laughs> um, which... Sorry, you are the first one, so we yeah. are working out all the technical details with you. Our apologies. No, no problem. Um, I should have had ready the uh, a presentation without the recording, but I hope it's I can quickly remove the video. So Okay, we're we're still maybe going to get your recording to run. So okay, just give we us can, another minute. We can see who who can do it faster. I'm just removing the the recording from the presentation. Okay, so I I have a presentation now without the, the recordings. I could do it. Okay, just go ahead and share and do it then. Hopefully I delayed it correctly. Okay, so you can see now uh, Google slide. Yeah, we're seeing the, uh, not the, okay, yeah, there we go, perfect. Okay. Okay, thank you, and my apologies. 
Uh, so, uh, my name is Patricia Martin Cabrera. I'm from the Flanders Marine Institute in Belgium. And on behalf of my colleagues that are uh, there uh, in, the, in the slide, I will present you the work we have been doing for the past year in the framework of the Jericho project um, uh, to establish plankton imagery data flows towards the international uh, biodiversity data aggregators. But first, uh, just to put you a bit of background, why do we study plankton? Uh, so here you see in the, in the schema, a typical pelagic food web where uh, we, we have uh, from plankton being uh, at the base of the uh, marine pelagic food webs, uh, followed uh, um, that is uh, composed by phytoplankton and zooplankton. And then uh, it goes all the way to the top of the marine food webs where we humans are feeding on fish, which feeds on uh, plankton. So uh, because of uh, the importance uh, they have uh, as uh, being uh, primary producers, they are absorbing uh, CO2 from the atmosphere and they are pro uh, producing uh, oxygen uh, and uh, they do uh, contribute to uh, retire uh, 50, uh, more than 50% of, of the CO2, which is a concern, uh, especially nowadays with uh, climate change. And um, so that is the reason why um, uh, it is very important for policies. Uh, so for instance, we have the Marine Strategy Framework, framework Directive, which uh, it considers pelagic habitats under the descriptor one biodiversity uh, uh, for the recommendations uh, to frame problems and solutions for the pelagic habitat assessment. And it's, it's for this reason why uh, we find uh, very important to have uh, plankton data available um, uh, for the monitoring of the pelagic habitat. But for this, we need to have long-term monitoring data uh, that is also covering a, a global um, a spatial uh, geographical uh, space. And uh, for this, uh, we need data. Now, uh, we do have uh, global uh, biodiversity um, uh, marine uh, databases, such, such as OBIS, where we can find a lot of data from plankton. Uh, but if we compare the image on the left with all the global observations that we find in OBIS with the image on the right, which is a, a, data, a web classifier called Ecotaxa, which also contains a lot of data that comes from images from plankton. So we still have quite a big gap and uh, to be able to really assess better the, the function of uh, plankton in the ecosystems. And for these uh, policies, uh, we need uh, to have more data. So this, what I'm showing now is uh, the uh, our tool that has been recently um, developed is yet under development, uh, but it's, uh, it's the, the Goose Bio Eco Portal, which by essential ocean variables, it shows you which monitoring uh, data is out there. So I have selected here the filters for phyto and zooplankton, uh, and there we can see all the data that uh, the, the project data that is available as of now, as it's, it's been inputted in this tool. Uh, so what I also liked is that we could see uh, we, there's a filter that you can also um, uh, filter by which data is in our public databases, so, such as obvious. And uh, the difference were really, big, really big. So we have 276 uh, monitoring programs. And in obvious, there is only 44 uh, data sets. So one of the reasons for having a lack of this data out there is uh, because this data, it can be plankton data that comes from the images. Uh, it can be really hard to standardize. Uh, so it's data that comes from many different instruments that are collected in uh, different with different methodologies. And this is because plankton has a very wide size range. Uh, as you can see on the graph on the bottom, so each of these instruments is targeting a different uh, size of plankton. Uh, 
but uh, in our final data database, what we want is to have um, uh, the standardized and harmonized data uh, to be able to look at it uh, uh, all together. Two core uh, terms, uh, worms for the taxonomy, the marine regions, uh, for place names, and the BODC vocabularies for instrument names, for example. So all this was presented in this best practices um, um, document where we explained how to follow, how to format this data, how to include all the metadata from the images. Uh, so for instance, there is a way to put uh, to, to submit a data set that has validated images or not, as the images can be classified by, by an algorithm or they can be validated by a taxonomist, an expert. So uh, this could also improve the amount, it could find the, uh, the compromise of having more data that can be less or more accurate in taxonomy, depending on what is the purpose, what is the question, research question to answer. And um, because I'm not sure how good I am doing by in time, but I won't go a lot in detail, but in these best practices, we are also uh, providing a data flow to be able to submit uh, data for from instrument, how to process this data using Ecotaxa or not for classifying the images, uh, where you can also have a, a, an output on this Darwin core OBIS M data format and to deliver it to the, the international data aggregators. So, uh, so this would be the example I have just shown the data flow, but with a real data set. So we have data in uh, Ecotaxa. So this is an image with all the different uh, parameters that are taken from the images. So once in Ecotaxa, you, you uh, prepare your output format, you will use the LiveWatch MONET Biology Quality Control Tool to make sure that there is the, all the correctness and completeness of the data set to be submitted to Eurobis uh, through their, their IPI, um, uh, IPT. Uh, and then uh, from Eurobis, it also flows to OBIS and uh, to GBIF. So yeah, in conclusion, uh, what we did was uh, enhancing imaging metadata for plankton data sets to be submitted to the, to the global uh, databases. Uh, so the community can take full advantage of this data. Uh, we had also um, fitted a common data format, not just reinventing the wheel. And uh, in this way, we can uh, make sure that the measurements coming from different methodologies and instruments are comparable. Uh, as well, we uh, suggest to use a fair imaging data flow that goes from instruments to European and international aggregators. And yeah, the, the global uh, collaboration and systematic data sharing were key to achieve this. Now what we need is that people follow this and submit their data. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Am I on? Hello. Thank you, Patricia. Am I on? Okay, thank you, Patricia, for an interesting talk and also for bravely starting us off uh, through the technical difficulties. That was wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Um, actually, why don't we have, um, is Steen here? Okay, if you wanna get them maybe to connect the uh, audio while we ask the questions, then we could be ready to go, so. Do we have a question? I didn't see any in the chat. Do we have any questions from the audience? Hello?
Is that my clicker? Okay. Um, I guess if no one, uh, yeah, go ahead. Here's one question. Yeah. Hi, Patricia. This is Abby Benson, I'm node manager with Ovis USA. And I was just curious if you have an estimate on the number of data sets that could be throwing through, flowing through this pathway um, to increase the number of, of data from plankton imaging. Um, hello, Abby. Uh, nice to hear from you. Um, well, I couldn't tell. I, I know that what we are doing for sure is data that it is already uh, in a Robis and Obis that we are going to do an update. So if, uh, I'm talking about the data from the, the, the people that work on this. We are already working on it. So in the next harvest, we will have uh, plankton data sets in Eurobis and Obis that have uh, more enriched data. And um, uh, yeah, ideally, uh, yeah, I would expect that pe more people use it, but uh, I think we have always this bottleneck that if uh, people in the projects do not have um, some uh, tasks allocated to do their data management, it becomes uh, really hard to really invest the time because sometimes it's, uh, yeah, it's, it takes a lot of time to, to format this data. So, but yeah, uh, as on all the projects I work, then that I work with plankton data, I am uh, pushing to, to do this. So for sure there will be some data sets uh, from, from Europe and as well from Brazil uh, coming towards uh, Obis in the, in the coming months. All right, thank you. So uh, I guess we'll go on to our next presentation, which is a, 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 an in-person one. And our speaker is Steen Dupont, and I'm gonna let him introduce his own topic. So yeah. go right ahead. It's not on there yet. Um, it's fine, we'll wait. Thank Fantastic. You. Um, right, thank you. My name is Steen Dupont. Uh, I'm from the Natural History Museum in London. And uh, it's easy just to say the title. So towards the next generation collections management system as part of the institutional and community data ecosystem. So more of a strategic talk, but I do promise that I'll leave you with more information uh, in, in regards to the poster where ha that has a bit more. Um, excuse me, just yeah? a second. I'm not seeing the uh, slides on the Zoom. Oh. I'm only seeing them in person. Sorry for the Sorry, it's fine. We should have gotten to one of the more interesting slides, though. <laughs> while, while we're waiting, I can make a disclaimer. A lot of the slides are infographics, so there's a lot of text on it. It's not meant for you to be reading all the small text. It is there if you want to get the slide pack, there's a lot more to unpack within the slides. Um, so apologies for your eyes if you're trying to read this. Um, I will try to guide you through the information that's on the slides. Thank you. 
Yeah, uh, me or oh, okay, sure. Sorry if, if we could have done that. Yeah, sure. Um, anyway, um, going on. So I think there's two things that need to be addressed first. Uh, in essence, it's um, making that work. Um, so Recode is a program within the Natural History Museum of London. It's a rethinking collections data ecosystem. It's a program that's been running for a while. I get into that. Um, more importantly, um, it has this vision. I think the focus is more mainly on the big, on the bold letters to promote management of art engagement with natural sciences and, and collections. Um, so that's Recode in itself. It's a big program with an initi initiative to look at collections management systems and the needs for the museum and how we get to the vision that we have. And that's sort of what it's all about. But I think to start with, it's important to just have a look at what a collections management system is. Now, this is Jack Ludden's infographic, so I do have to credit him. Um, but if we start at the top, usually it starts with an object, it starts with the physical thing that we have in the collection, and that's what the collections management system is about. It's about managing that physical entity, the data around it, the, the metadata, everything else. And you can see there's a lot of happen things happening with that object. There's the capture, the documentation, the preservation, publishing, there's the use, which is probably what we're more about here is how do we use that data and get that data out there. Um, but there's also maintaining the collections. What there also is, of course, is a number of challenges. And this is what Recode really has been dealing with for many, many years before Recode, the program actually got established. There are the metadata integrities, leveraging automated workflows, APIs, discoverability, public discoverability, but as well, governance, making decisions, and making sure that the system is, is fundamentally future-proof and we can deal with it for longevity. So this is part of what spurred uh, Recode on. It doesn't vary that much for, from general museum um, strategies in that sense that most museums today are looking at integrating their data for decision making and to have a view of what's happening across the board. Um, so in fact, looking at what's happening and what if, using the data for, the, for those decisions, we have the data sources, we have the systems, what we're essentially missing are those data discovery layers that fit on top within the systems. Um, because with that, you can move on to the contextual reporting and the visualizations that will allow institutions and researchers to, to create more with that data. So the Recode vision, the vision of a new collections management system doesn't really vary that much from the institutional decision itself. The program's been going on for, I'll get into the interesting stuff in just a second. Uh, the program's been going on since 2020. And as you can see, we're coming into 2023 soon, which is where we're actually moving into uh, implementation of a new system. And then, of course, there's several years following that. But how do we get to something that is fit for purpose that we can use for longevity? Well, it first comes with the understanding that we are part of a community. It is not just us building something for ourselves. Um, we want to be open. We want to share with our community. We want to learn from that community to start with, not do something and then figure out how it fits in. Um, so to get to that, we already have material available that you can look at. Um, I can see that my OSF link is missing, but I'll, I'll direct you to the real um, bulk of the information in just a second. The point is that we have three scenarios. We have what do we do internally? What is the landscape internally? And we need to emulate that. We need a system we can transition to. Um, so that's something we need to emulate. But in essence, we need to aim to deliver something bigger, right, within the institution. We have a landscape of um, systems and, and um, activities that need to put data into the system alongside all the, all the information. But that's what we aim to deliver. What we need to make achievable is the community vision. It's where the museum, does that work? No, it doesn't. Uh, it's where the museum sits within that whole landscape of all the different things that we need to pump data to, get data back from, deal with, right? So that's, that's, that's the aim. And that's where it sort of comes in, because if you're going from A to C, if our vision is to get there, we can't start at A. What we, actually, what we have to do is we have to start here and then use all that information, all that knowledge, and make sure that we do it correctly in the beginning. And that's where it comes into the whole, that's essentially why I'm here at this conference, because a lot of that revolves around the data architecture and the data modeling. Um, so where we are at now, and what we're doing currently, other than sort of 
of outlining the requirements for a system and getting a supplier is understanding all those standards, the new, the old, what's coming, what works, what doesn't work, but essentially also making sure that any solution can deal with interoperability, um, standards, data quality, uh, data sharing, but also engaging with new technologies. We are engaging with a new sector um, at present, um, but also I think just as importantly, both internally and externally is bringing about a digital transformation and a culture change. A lot of our users within the museum do things because they've done it that way for 25 years, uh, more. They might have to change because we might have to have more um, similarity across the museum, across our users. So there will be constraints, there will be things. There's a huge change that needs to happen. And of course, uh, museum being a museum, there needs to be a reason to do this. And, and part of it is to try to do something with and for the community, trying to be as open as possible, trying to learn something from the community and trying to deliver something that helps us engage with the community. Um, and this, this is the one that I'm hoping <laughs> will make the, the talk worthwhile. Uh, there is a post that does talk about the data standards and, and the data model, the conceptual data model we have so far. Um, for scrutiny, it'll come up in the poster session, of course. Um, as well as this talk itself, hopefully spurring on some conversations and some dialogue uh, with this community and hopefully allowing me to come back at some point and, and showcase what happened, what we've managed to do and whether it works, to be honest, because this is a huge journey. It's a huge thing that we're, we're trying to do. Um, so maybe I won some time. I'm not quite sure, uh, but I'd like to thank, of course, all of you, conference, the museum itself. Um, and that's it. Speed talk. Thank you, Steen. So I think you did come in quite a bit under your 10 minutes, so we should have time for questions. And uh, let's see, pick us if you want to um, be thinking about connecting. That's good. Um, okay, so are there any questions from the audience? You can come up and, uh, and use the microphone or uh, put your questions in the chat if you're remote. Hi, <clears throat> Henry Engeldahl from Mesa Botanic Garden. Um, so I know you had to fly through this really quickly, so I'm not quite sure. I like the idea that you have a solution that you're trying to accommodate for those things. Um, and I would like to see the poster, but I'm assuming that there are maybe a basic set of things that if you're getting for a new CMS, these things you have to have if you want to get the biggest bang for your buck. Of course, we as as the as well. Maybe I went too through too fast. The emulate slide does, of course, mean that we do have to present the function. There has to be a system that we can work with as a museum and and and, and meet all those requirements that a museum has to manage a collection. Of course, we were not going to implement something that can't work for us, but underlying, making sure that our data models are flexible, that we understand the data starting standards that we currently have and that might come are essential because if not, we might end up building something that can't accommodate what comes in the future. And that's the whole plan. The plan is to make something flexible enough that we can keep improving it and not get, um, well, not be able to do that. Okay, we can uh, probably have time for another question if, if someone has one. All right. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Okay. Yeah, you get that. <laughs> This is your, this one is yours, right? Yes, yes, I am. And this way. 
Uh, sorry, yeah. sorry so, I should have let somebody yeah. else do that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, great. So again, thank you for bearing with us on the technical difficulties. So Vikas Gupta is next, and uh, we'll let him introduce the topic of his talk. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Vikas Gupta. I'm working for EBI Cambridge. So here on behalf of my colleagues, I'm going to present a tool source attribute helper, uh, basically, uh, which helps in uh, accurately reporting the biological source of data. So in my further service, I will talk about basically why do we need it, need such a tool and how it helps uh, users to correctly report the uh, biological source of data. So Talking about the nature of biological source of sequence data, it is user provided. It is a free text field which, in which user key in the information. At times, user fails to report the data accurately. Sometimes they make spelling mistakes. Sometimes they don't know. So basically, what institution, what collection. So they just put what is their best guess. So that's how it. Whenever it happens that the user doesn't provide the accurate data, it basically it results into incorrect linking of sequence data to the material of origin, and we could not relate the data in system. So we felt like there is a need that basically there should be some tool which can help users to come up with accurate institution information, accurate collection information, so that data can be linkable. So, sorry, <clears throat> we came up with a tool uh, idea, which is a very first step in this uh, domain. So source attribute helper. What it does is basically it utilizes LCBI bio collections of institutions and collections database. So basically user uses, <clears throat> so this tool uses this information to suggest users exactly what they want to do to construct an attribute, to validate an attribute. If they have already have constructed an attribute, they can always validate if it, it contains the right information or not. And also suggest if say they, it's a kind of fuzzy search or elastic search database. So basically, if user user has some idea that what kind of inform, institution or collection he's looking he or she is looking out for, yes, tool suggests uh, the possible options to users so that they can uh, choose the right one. Again, the attributes which are handled, attribute types which are handled by this tool are specimen voucher, culture collection, biomaterial. This tool doesn't validate specimen IDs, culture IDs, material ID yet, but the moment we get information of data sets on these as well, we'll integrate in this tool and this tool become, can become more robust for users to use. Uh, to see basically, um, to emphasize more on how this tool can be helpful, uh, we've got some statistics from Marcus, Marcus Rain, some analysis uh, based on this tool, basically using this tool, and there were some interesting facts which came up. So around Marcus and team actually requested around 579,000 records in which we found exact matches of 414 plus records, 1,000 records. So which is a great success that yes, users are reporting very right data. So which is a very good thing. There were partial matches of around 65, 6,545, which means that tool is suggesting as well that yes, there is a partial match and we can always correct the data using the uh, suggestions from the tool. Now, there were around 1,000, uh, sorry, 161,000 records which were not validated. Those, so those, those needed, so those needed to be analyzed. And when we analyzed those 161,000 records, we found that most of the records basically here contain incorrect information like uh, variants of personal, which is a keyword in free text field, which cannot be related to uh, relate, uh, relate to any of the institution or collection. So that needed attention. Again, 47 IDs contain unknown institution and 4,246 4, IDs contain 
known uh, unknown collection codes so the major part of the problem was the variants of personal keywords so users are putting some information which they don't know or they are not able to get the right information from this system so that's where this tool can help users to come up with the right information of about institutions and collections so again uh, talking about the data source for this tool uh, i just wanted to emphasize here that we are using ncbi data collection basically which is a curated data source of meta uh, metadata for culture collections museums habia and other natural history uh, collections so we process those uh, for data collection uh, data uh, population we fetch the information from bio collection database and uh, populate our elastic data store which basically on which we run the fuzzy searches to help users to come up with the right information uh, moving on to the actual tool apis which are very well uh, available publicly right now so there are uh, five core apis which we, uh, i want to present here so one is the institution information so user can using these apis user can get the institution information even if user has doesn't have the complete idea of what kind of institution he is looking he or she is looking out for they can always key in some information it system will su suggest the possible institution information to users to, to select again user can get the collections for a particular institution if user you know the institution he can he or she can always check for the collections user can always check out for the codes for uni, basically institution and collection combination as well so that he has he or she has the right information user can validate and any any pre constructed attribute let's say user has already has the attribute pre constructed and they just want to validate that information system allows them to validate as well that's where basically markus and team use the same same api same, same api to come up with these statistics as well so we uh, they ran this statistics on the nc uh, insdc sequences database uh, data set and yes this uh, api very well worked for us uh, then we have construct api where tool allows user to select the institution and select the collection and then uh, tool construct the attribute and helps user to save that attribute as well uh, on their machine again these api endpoints are available as part of swagger documentation online so you can uh, user can are very well basically go through the documentation then they can integrate with their systems as well uh, this is the snapshot from the sorry this is not coming up okay uh, let me see if i can show you these api in this view it is visible but in presentation mode if i it is not coming up let's see yeah great it has come up now okay so this is a, a, a gui graphical user interface for end users who will just want to use this user uh, use this tool to construct or validate an attribute instead of integrating the apis so if you see this tool oh, okay yeah perfect yeah so okay so this tool basically in this uh, user can always select the attribute type present voucher culture collection bio collections user can select an institution user will start typing and system will suggest the uh, possible names as well for institution then uh, collections respective collections will load in and then user can key in the identifier code and the, that's how system helps in custom the attribute similarly for validate if user already has the pre constructed attribute user can key in uh, key in the information here so basically a user enters the information and then clicks on validate it works for the user uh, let me see if i can give you to demo uh, maybe i'll just cover the uh, rest of the slides first in respect of time so potential of uses of this uh, tool can be integrations so it can be integrated with submission systems uh, so that users can automatically get uh, information from this tool instead of basically going to some other interface and just uh, selecting the information uh, so this tool can be very well integrated with the submission systems and this existing gui uh, gui graphical user interface is available to users to use yeah okay and yeah there are acknowledgments bicycle team ncbi collections in markus to run this analysis so 
thanks marcus and yeah i'm more or less done i just wanted to show the ui but there is a link in bottom of this presentation which you can use to where else see the demonstration they are simple two pages yeah i'm done thank you any questions all right thank you yeah are there any questions in the audience or in the chat nothing in the chat so far yes hi ben smith nhm london um a very quick question who do you envisage as the main users for this is it the people depositing data is it the institutions uh, is it organizations like jeep if who are the who are the main users in your mind uh, so people who are submitting the data are the main users for this tool because they would need all this information of institution collections to which they should be able to relate the data data should be linkable so that's how it is Just a quick response to that, because I think one of the, the key things, especially for the big institutions, is actually understanding how much of their content is in these databases to start with. And maybe there's a kind of a GBIF type model here, whereby GBIF does a fantastic job of telling each institution how their data is being used. And I think that might be something that could follow through to the big sequence databases in terms of kind of that same level of detail about how their collections are being represented in those databases and that would get the collections more hooked in if you like to, to that community that might be something to think about yes so Jana, would you like to add yeah yeah thank you hi i'm joanna uh is from ena so this is on yeah okay uh, uh just to tell that uh yes so one of the purpose of this this is for users to use but one of the purpose is to be able to further link the data that is in ena so the sequence data with the uh, origin of the specimens and then gabif can get that information quite easily by because we are using institution codes that are also the same as Gabif has in its uh, bio collection, so uh, that is possible. So Gabif can also get that information to link the data in their clustering algorithm. So that that's one of the purposes also of this tool. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. All right. Thank you. Um, so I think maybe we should transition to the next one since it's a remote one and it might take us a moment to connect. Um, so the next presentation is by Vishnu Kumar Kardavelu. Um, and are you, uh, I saw you on the Zoom. Yes. Do you know, were you planning to present live or do or you're recording? Yeah, I'm planning to use the live one actually. Yeah. I'm sorry? I'm planning to use the live presentation. Live presentation, okay, yes. great. All right, well, I'll let you go ahead and introduce the topic yourself. And if you wanna just share your screen in the Zoom, you can go ahead. Uh, uh, I think now uh, everyone are able to view my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Great. Uh, so my uh, camera is a little tilted, so please uh, don't mind that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so hello, everyone. And uh, uh, myself, uh, Vishnu Kumar. Uh, I'm a software engineer working for uh, European Nucleotide Archive, uh, shortly ENA, uh, which is in like Embel EBI in uh, Cambridge, United Kingdom. And uh, uh, welcome to the talk on enabling community curation of uh, biological source annotations of molecular data through Pluto F and the Elixir contextual data clearinghouse. So yeah, um, so this uh, third party annotations are like, this is just about a little overview, like uh, third party annotations are, uh, you know, like it's a valuable resource uh, in improving the quality of uh, DNA sequences, uh, especially the public DNA sequences. So like uh, sequences in the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration, which is we shortly call as INSDC, like it, it lacks some uh, important uh, features or metadata like uh, habitat, locality, or country and their coordinates. So those are like uh, lagging for some uh, uh, some of the sequence data. So the consider the other case, like uh, species names in every DNA sequences must be like, uh, you know, considered as equal uh, hypothesis in the current scientific world. So, so this is where like we have the platform like uh, 
Pluto F and Elixir contextual data uh, clearing house, which comes together like uh, to make it possible actually. So yeah. Uh, so this linking of this both the uh, platforms like uh, uh, like it was like effortless reporting of uh, gaps between the sequence metadata uh, annotations actually. Uh, so uh, let's uh, speak about the, like ENA, like uh, uh, which is the European node of the INSDC, and uh, which is hold the uh, which holds like large amount of annotations associated with sequence data, and it has the infrastructures, uh, tools, and uh, you know like services for archiving and managing the petabytes of uh, data, like and its associated metadata as well. Like, uh, so we generally think like, uh, like we need to explore the full potential of molecular resources. So, so that, that needs to be a good linkage between the sequence data and its biological uh, source actually. So like this request, like a, a well foundation for like, you know, like well-structured and accessible annotation should be uh, available in the uh, repositories. Yeah. So, um, so this work was like developed with the scope of uh, Bicycle, which is like a, a biodiversity community integrated knowledge library. So which is a, which comes under the uh, support of Bicycle project, and like uh, uh, they establishes like open source practices in uh, biodiversity domain, and you can see like their infrastructure um, uh, partners and uh, uh, other partners uh, we have listed here. And you have a, a link of like bicycle project where you can find uh, more such relevant information there. And uh, yeah, so like uh, when we speak about uh, linking of uh, data, like uh, like uh, the annotations are associated with sequence data, which are related to its uh, biological source, like specimens, uh, uh, suppose like specimens in uh, uh, natural history collections, and uh, how the linkage is established between uh, like the data and uh, uh, and the repositories is like using different flows like uh, maintaining the data standards and uh, submitting like uh, uh, we have like submission workflows and we have like uh, very important like content enrichment work enrichment workflows so which allows to enable the uh, great linkage and integration between the repositories and the actual data so like uh, uh, some so this is where like I'm oh, sorry yeah, so this is where, uh, in order to establish that, uh, we come up with the uh, two platforms. Uh, one is like contextual data clearing house, which is the we shortly call as CDCH, like which is the API, uh, which is uh, backend for the uh, Pluto F web platform, which actually supports this feature. Uh, yes. So uh, let's uh, speak about the Pluto F first, which is an like uh, online data management platform, uh, and uh, they provide like computing services. It's like the registered users. Uh, basically, the registered users uh, in the Pluto F can uh, uh, can log in and manage a wide like variety of uh, uh, data annotations, like taxon occurrences, uh, metabar coding data. So which can be like uh, 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 the proposal can be put for the sequence annotations. So like now next is like Elixir CDCH, which is that uh, backend processor for the Pluto F web platform. And uh, it has been uh, developed by keeping in mind that uh, to extend, uh, to extend correcting and improving like public level of annotation records, which is in both samples and sequences. So it is an API, which is supposed to exchange of data uh, uh, backed by LifeSense uh, research infrastructure authentication. So they have the authentication mechanism where it supports users to manage the profile and uh, it helps to uh, do the annotation proposals with the system. And uh, now, now it's like content enrichment workflows like um, uh, when we say about sequence and sample annotations are often like having like uh, incorrect metadata, um, uh, say ambiguity or sometimes it's uh, uh, inaccurate as well. So uh, for example, like the ambiguity arises, like in the case um, when you try to add the specimen ID, like uh, without the institute information. So now you can see the multiple in, in multiple institution with the same specimen ID. So which leads to like uh, ambiguity when you uh, submit the data. So we have defined the workflow with these two systems uh, uh, to overcome this uh, uh, problem. And uh, this is that uh, overall like uh, 
workflow of uh, how our system works. So generally, um, uh, uh, we always like download the metadata from the uh, INSDC, like using the NCBI's uh, um, uh, utilities on the regular basis. So these data together with Pluto F, like uh, own database records prior to submitting INSTC, like they are like stored and made available for third party annotation in Pluto F. And, uh, and the workflow uh, steps are like, you know, user annotates uh, sequence metadata by clicking on the annotated link in the uh, Pluto F web platform. So they can have a view and they can uh, make an, they can make an like annotation proposal. So it can be created and um, that verification notification would be sent to the uh, designated reviewer. So in this case, ideally it would be the uh, repositories like, uh, um, and uh, when the reviewer accepts the annotation proposal or rejects it with the comment. So, so this is how the flow works. Like the, the annotation can be either accepted or annotation fields that could be mapped to ENA fields are uh, like pushed to the uh, clearinghouse API. Uh, it's a RISPL API as well. So, yeah, so here you can see some uh, yeah, two minutes left. Uh, yeah, so if you can see like uh, uh, some general data about if I want to uh, update this particular sequence GU941203, like if I want to add the new uh, metadata called isolation source, so um, like for the values of water, um, so the supporting details can be fetched from ontology lookup service and uh, the provider name can be given as Pluto F. So once you submit this uh, proposal, uh, then here the processing is happening. So the repositories, they review, they either process that proposal, they either uh, put on on hold or they can, they could reject as well. And uh, they can give some notes like uh, approve the annotation proposal. And uh, here are some uh, uh, retrieval APIs where you can uh, fetch data based on data types. In this case, like uh, uh, we don't have any data types for non-COVID types. And right now the provider name could be like Pluto F, and record types we support is sample and uh, sequence. Oh, sorry about that. And uh, if you want to uh, fetch all the annotation proposals for Pluto F, you just give the provider name as Pluto F. And if you want to filter it, filter furthermore with the record type as sequence, we can do that as well. And here is some uh, general overview of how the page looks and how we maintain histories and how it has been displayed in the Pluto, Pluto F web platform. And here's some inter interesting statistics, like uh, currently our Elixir CDCH API, I mean, uh, the data source stores uh, nearly like 27 point million of uh, COVID-19 sequence records and sample records, and uh, like nearly 2.3 percentage of non-COVID records as well. So right now, Pluto has like 480, uh, 4 annotation proposals across uh, 1,521 different sequences. And uh, so when you say about non-COVID non -COVID data, Pluto F holds like 0.80 percentage of uh, whole data. And uh, yeah, here are the uh, collaborators and others who needs to be like uh, acknowledged for the very good work over here. And yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks, TDWG. I'm like open for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, if you have any questions in the audience here, come on up to the front and ask them. And I don't see any in the chat yet, but go ahead and, and put them in the chat if you have them. Um, hi, this is Debbie Paul, and I have a question about your comment about the like the metadata uh, for some of this. Does this tool also include possible ways to improve that situation so the data coming in is is better to go along with these annotations? Uh, you mean like possible values? Uh, so in case of values, we have uh, we don't have uh, uh, any uh, recommendation, but we follow like always like uh, uh, INSDC's uh, format of submitting the data. Uh, like suppose in this case, if you see like uh, uh, there's isolation source, so this can be the uh, uh, attribute metadata you want to change. So these are like we always follow like INSDC's format of uh, metadata. 
So for values, it's like uh, there's no strict values you can uh, put right now. So the values lay open right now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we, we can have one more question if anyone has one. Still not seeing anything in the chat. Okay, well, I don't see any more questions. So I would like to thank uh, all of our live and remote presenters for, uh, for dealing with a little bit of stress relating to dealing with the technical issues. And thank you to uh, our in-person and remote audiences for, your, uh, uh, for being patient with us. And also uh, Terry and Deb, my colleagues, thank you for <laughs> watching the time and the questions. So thank you so much for attending. And the next thing up is lunch, hooray. And in an hour and a half, we'll pick up with the next sessions in this venue and also the, the other one over there. So thank you everyone for attending. <laughs>